Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 328. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because we are going to talk about something that we don't talk about anywhere near enough, but yet it affects all of us. I mean, you are participating in this thing, and you don't even understand sometimes how it works, what makes it work, and more importantly, why things may go up or down or sideways. Yes, I am talking about the economy. You're like, what? I had no idea that that's what you were going to say, Jay. I know somebody figured it out, and that's great. Well, today's guest is uber qualified to do so, and what I'm excited about is he's got a unique perspective, and more importantly, he's going to share that perspective with you and I. I have with me today none other than Mr. Ed Connard. He is the former managing director and founding partner, along with a name you may remember, Mitt Rodney of Bain Capital. And what's really interesting is that He's got two New York Times bestsellers, as well as a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Some of you may know it as AEI, but what I like is the titles of his two books. So, in case you didn't know, the first one was Unintended Consequences, Why Everything You've Been Told About the Economy is Wrong. Now, that's awesome. And then the second one, The Upside of Inequality, How Good Intentions Undermine the Middle Class. We are going to dig into his brain today and hopefully pull out the information that you need. Now, remember, we may come out with data, but when we get the data, we have to take it and turn it into information and interpret it so that we know what process we need to go do. So let's talk and listen and take notes with Mr. Ed Connard. Ed, you there? Yes, I am. Glad that you're here. You are quite welcome, and I'm glad that you're here. Um, I'm sure you're quite busy these days, and more importantly, the economy is always doing something cool. (laughs) Yeah, it's a it's a big, complicated uh, machine out there that uh, it's almost like a living being, I suppose. Indeed, indeed. Now, this being the first time that you are here, I tend to ask everybody the same question the first time that they're here with us. Uh, Are you ready? Yes. All right. So I tend to look at everybody or all entrepreneurs a lot like, you know, today's entrepreneurs are a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, Batman, Robin, Superman, Wonder Woman, etc. Superheroes. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. And you, sir, of course, are one of them. What do I mean by that? I mean, occasionally, you know, entrepreneurs, at least in our own mind, we get dressed up and we fly around and we save our customers and and, and either we disseminate information, give them products or services in various forms and fashion that help them. But also, like superheroes, we have a beginning. You know, if you think about it, Spider-Man had a beginning. Before he was Spider-Man, he was just kind of taking pictures and going to school. He didn't do much. So, my question to you, sir, is... Before working alongside Mitt Romney, before your two books, before being the visiting scholar, before doing all the things, even at, before your work at, at Ford Motor Company, even before all of that, what we want to know is, who is Ed Connard? Well, I don't know that I know the answer to that. I can tell you I was just <laughs> an average middle class kid growing up uh, in Detroit, right? Uh, the suburbs of Detroit on the borderline. I, I always kid that Eminem was very proud of the fact that he lived south of eight mile. I lived south of five mile. Wow. Um, um, I really didn't have big aspirations. I went to a high school that had 750 kids in my graduating class. It was called Redford Union High School, and our chant was, are you high? Yes, we are. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I was a a good student. I wasn't uh, a great student. I wasn't the the valedictorian or anything like that. I I never really uh, took it very seriously. I didn't read any books. Uh, 
uh, you know, that were assigned to me in English class or anything <laughs> like that. I was, I was the student council president, um, and I went to the University of Michigan, um, and I uh, was very good at math. I became an engineer, and uh, ironically, I turned down a job at uh, uh, Arthur Anderson Consulting, which became a very big and uh, fast-growing company. I turned down that job to work as a manufacturing engineer at Ford Motor Company. I traveled around to uh, assembly plants to try to figure out why cars wouldn't uh, fit together more effectively. I worked in engine engineering and body engineering, tra- designing the products that we were trying to assemble in the plants. I, I got laid off from Ford Motor Company. Uh, um, a friend of mine got into Harvard Business School. I thought, geez, if he can get in, I can get in. So I sent him an application. I was going to night school in, in Detroit to business school. Uh, I, I sent in an application. It was the only application to business school I sent because I just thought I'd continue to go to night school while I got another job. And I got in and it uh, it changed my life. I, I got a job at uh, Bain, Bain Consulting, which was a management consulting company after I graduated. And uh, I, I met Mitt Romney at Bain Consulting. He went on to start Bain Capital. I, uh, uh, I worked for very large corporations on a lot of their strategic issues as a partner at I mean, as a well, I was a partner at Bain Consulting for a while, but I left and went briefly to Wall Street. I went. This is not for me. I, I my really my expertise is in business and people and and running companies and, and and implementing ideas. It wasn't even though there's a lot of finance at Bain Capital. Really, I wasn't really a banker at heart. I didn't think I would enjoy it. So I left, and uh, uh, Mitt Romney was recruiting people who had left Bain Consulting to come back to Bain Consulting, and I said. I don't want to, I was a partner in a consulting firm. I was a partner in an investment bank. I don't want to go back and be a partner in a consulting firm. But if you make me a partner at Bain Capital, I'd come back. He said, we're too small. We can't afford you. I said, I'll work for free. And you can just look back in time and you decide whether or not you thought I was valuable, how valuable I was. And you can pay me anything you want. And he said, well, that's a deal I can't refuse. And then he offered me a job to come uh, work at Bain Capital. And uh, I... The first investment I made uh, was a company, uh, Waters Corporation. I still sit on the board today. We debated about whether to pay $360 million or $365 million. Today, it's worth about $10 billion. So uh, <laughs> you know, we stupidly sold it long before it became worth that much money. Uh, shows you that we really didn't know what we were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. But anyway, it was very successful, and that uh, that sort of sealed my fate and made me a partner at Bain. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So uh, what I'm getting, though, what's interesting is the that there are so many similarities and, and lessons that I know many uh, entrepreneurs have gone through and definitely real estate investors as they're out there, you know, fighting to build their enterprise and build cash flow so that they can just feed their family, whether they're from five mile or eight mile, doesn't really matter. Yeah. The point is, is we all have to do that. And we use our unique skills, talents and abilities to do that in, in various different ways. Now, I, I've, I've got a couple of questions. So you graduate high school, the first job was over at, or sorry, uh, you went to Ford Motor Company? Yeah, my first job was working at Kentucky Fried Chicken, but oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and my second job was working as a dishwasher in a restaurant that was a couple blocks from my house. I eventually became a, a busboy, um, and I worked there through college. Got it. And then when uh, so after college, the, that's when Ford Ford Motor Company came into play. Then I yeah, my, between my junior and senior year of, of engineering school, I. I worked a summer job at Ford Motor Company working in engine engineering, and then they offered me a full-time job when I graduated. Got it. Now your My friend- dad worked at Ford. He was an engineer at Ford. Well, and I just think it's interesting how you go from engineering to business school. That just was like, that seems to be a big jump. So I, I, um, I was always interested in business. My engineering degree is in operations research, which is kind of managerial economic or sort of mathematical decision making. But, you know, it's funny. I was work. I was walking around. I worked in Ford assembly plants on the line trying to get the doors to fit onto cars more uh, 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 carefully because the Japanese were gaining a lot of market share with what were called fits and finishes, much better finishes. And and I thought to myself, with all this capital that's required 
uh, to run Ford Motor Company, there's no way that an employee could ever make a lot of money. You have to be in something where the investors, the capital, doesn't really create all the value, doesn't control all the value that's created. And so even though I was doing lots of valuable things as an engineer for Ford, I was thinking to myself, if I was creating, doing that for myself, if I was creating valuable ideas and capturing the value myself, I'd be making a lot more money than in this very capital intensive Ford Motor Company. Now, the problem was slightly solved for me because it was very cyclical. And then there was a downturn in 1970, 1980. And I was laid off and lost my job. So uh, that required uh, you know, desperate measures, I suppose. Well, okay, this is good uh, because this uh, tends to be the the thing you know that uh, requires us to wake up and find other skill sets that we didn't know we even had at times. But my, I guess, my question is: is you said something that I want you to unpack a little bit. You said you you wanted to be in something where the majority of the value wasn't directly tied to the amount of capital that was there. Can you help help us understand what you meant by that? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's something I talk about in, in, the, in my book as well, which is the economy is changing from a ca- manufacturing, capital-intensive economy, where if you're Ford Motor Company, plants, equipment, cars, inventory, dealerships, real estate, to companies like Google and Facebook, which can scale to economy-wide success, without needing any capital at all, and the world is a much bigger place. So like uh, Taylor Swift, I have a 13-year-old daughter, so you know, I know a lot about Taylor <laughs> Swift. She, when, she, when she achieves worldwide success, the world economy is way bigger today than it was when I was growing up in the 1960s. Uh, you know, it's, I think the whole world economy was about the size of China in the 1960s as China is today. So when you achieve that worldwide success, it makes you so much bigger than a doctor, a lawyer, a school teacher, a bus driver, a waitress who's constrained by the number of customers that they can serve. They can only serve so many customers, so they can only get so big, as opposed to, say, a Taylor Swift who can serve the whole world just by singing a song. That's going to make her and her success much, much bigger than the average person. So I didn't really understand all of this when I was back at Ford, but I did walk around the plant thinking to myself, how am I going to put money in my pocket and not in the pocket of the investors of Ford Motor Company? And I looked and I said, this very, very capital intensive company is never, the, the, the employees are never going to have the negotiating leverage, the ability to capture the value because without all the cap value, the capital, we can't really create that much value. It's, it's in combination with the capital that creates the value. Now, you know, it's funny because I turned down a job at, at Arthur Anderson Computer Consulting, which was the very kind of business I would later come to discover was the most interesting aspect of the modern economy, which is a business almost completely expertise intensive. It's not very capital intensive. Um, and it's a you know, this is something I learned in consulting as well. I've always said I'm an outstanding engineer who made all my money as a mediocre salesman, which was you know, I was able to use the expertise in consulting. You step from there, really being an engineer, to being a salesman of engineering services, and your ability to produce those engineering services helps you to be a better salesman of them. It gives you the credibility to be a better salesman of them. And because you're in direct contact with a customer, as opposed to, say, Ford Motor Company, where I'm on the plant floor and, you know, you're millions and millions of hours of TV advertising away from the customer, you, I was interacting with the customer directly saying, hey, I can sell this. I can get a commission. I could do this on my own. I could provide these services without needing a really expensive brand name and a whole lot of capital to make me as effective as I can be. I'm making myself as effective as I can be. Indeed, indeed. Now, if I hear you correctly, though, what you're saying is that the way the economy has changed uh, actually requires us, either as entrepreneurs or what have you, to reevaluate how we bring value to the marketplace. Because if we just operate, you know, we you think just simple concepts like the theory of constraints, uh, we're if if we don't do it, we're very limited, not because our, our value is limited, but because just the number of people we can be in front of and serve. Yes, yes. I, I think that there's been this shift in the economy. This is the first chapter, by the way, in the book, which is you've gone from uh, you've gone to these companies like a Google and a Facebook that can scale all the way up to economy wide success. They're cash flow positive all the way 
from the start to the finish. They really don't need any investors at all. And that lottery-like success, you have a one in a thousand, one in a million shot at achieving it. But what you see is our most talented workers are all racing to get into that lottery. They're all running to Silicon Valley to work in this lottery-like capability. And there are, just like Ford had institutional capabilities that made me as an engineer be able to create millions of dollars of value for Ford Motor Company, getting on the job training at a company like Google or Facebook, being able to work in Silicon Valley with networks of experts, having uh, 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 relationships with access to venture capital where the investors have a deep understanding of the things that they're investing in. All of those things are making our most productive workers way more productive than they are their counterparts in Europe and Japan. And part of the reason for that is that's because they work in their they work in Mercedes Benz. We work at Google and Facebook. If you look at the market value, the, the Googles and Facebooks of the world, because people think the future all lies there, are way more valuable than the manufacturing companies, which most people see as kind of getting completely automated and no real many employees working there in the future. It's it's a it's a it's not seen as anywhere near as valuable. So the training that those workers are getting, the institutions they're working in, the communities of experts they're working in, the investor community that they have access to is not as valuable as what you're finding in the United States. Got it. Got it. Totally understood. So I, I know when you start to bring up things like capital, et cetera, the the real estate amongst the listeners picked up mm-hmm. because they, it, it's one of the things that helps us to go out there to create uh, the value as needed, as opposed to, say, the the online marketer or the the, the education or the coach or the, you know, what have you, because that mm-hmm. that's a little bit easier and less capital intensive. But I guess my question is, from your perspective, um, you know, there's there's something that I've always said that I just currently believe is true, that there's way more money than there is expertise to use it. So what is the role, if you would say, of, of equity or capital in today's economy? What should it be doing? Yes. So uh, it's, a, it's an issue that I do address in the book as well. But let me just – real estate is a capital-intensive business. Um, and I think what you find in, in successful real estate developers and people who are successful in real estate, they actually separate the capital – from the expertise, and they're really capitalizing on the expertise today and forming uh, real estate partnerships and going out and getting outside investors and then taking their carried interest on the on the organization of the investment and the building and the creation and the management of it. They've really been able to divide, separate the expertise from the capital intensity. And most of the guys who are being successful are really being successful because of their expertise as opposed to the capital intensity. Now, I also say something interesting, which I think relates to real estate in the book, which is there's two kinds of capital. All real estate developers know this, uh, equity and debt, right? Debt is very risk averse. Equity is risk bearing. It bears the risks of gains and losses. I argue in the book that what you see today, and, and real estate is thought of as a less risky investment, if you will, than trying to start a company from scratch. And so risk-averse investors, you'll see where I'm going with this in a second, Mm -hmm. Uh, debt providers of debt are more willing to invest in those uh, enterprises than they are in some other enterprises like Google Startups, for example, where it's all or nothing and they may never get repaid. And so what you find, and I argue this in the book, which is the trade deficit, which reached 5.5% of GDP prior to the financial crisis, is at 3.5% today, floods our economy with risk-averse savings that, that business like Google and Facebook have very little use for. And I explain how it floods. but And that leaves that money sitting on the sidelines, unused, but for two other constraints. So savings used to be the constraint to growth, but I agree with you that today what we see is an abundance of savings, and our problem is, How do you get those savings put to work? The two constraints we bump into, properly trained talent, i.e. expertise, and willingness and capacity to take risk, which is some combination of equity that's willing to bear the the gains and losses, and equity, properly trained talent is the other side of the coin because if I have expertise, my investments are less risky. If I have talented people, they're able to implement my ideas with less risk. They're able to supervise other people in a more effective way. 
All of those things increase the return and reduce the risks to the risks that my capital, my equity is bearing. And so I argue that entrepreneurial risk taking and properly trained talent are the constraints to growth today because the trade deficit floods us with not equity, but risk averse savings that turn into debt. And part of the reason why we've seen uh, the real estate market be as robust as it has been uh, is because we're, we're pumping the economy full of, of, of risk averse savings. And how does that happen? We buy a product from, say, Germany. And rather than buying a product from the U.S. that employs U.S. workers, they loan us the money that they earned from, from selling us a product. And we have to borrow that money and put it to work, uh, whether we you know, loan it to a subprime homeowner who consumes it or we loan it to a real estate developer who builds real estate or does you know improves real estate or we loan it to a business. Now, we know the businesses have been on net cash flow positive. So they're actually generating, they're putting more savings into the banking system than they're actually withdrawing from the banking system. And so the one area that we really have that can employ this risk of our savings has been real estate, which is which we've seen be quite robust in this economy because of this abundance of risk of our savings. Now, that I'm more interested from my perspective in how do you get lesser skilled workers employed? How do you get them to the highest possible wage? The problem is you think about the old corn economy, you can eat the corn, that's that's consumption. You can plant the corn, that's investment, that's risk taking. But you can also stick the corn in the silo. That's risk averse savings. That's where you save, but you don't consume and you don't invest. What happens is the corn starts building up in the silo. Now, if you don't put that corn back to work by eating it or planting it, you're going to get slower growth, higher unemployment or lower wages. You can always get you know, uh, uh, higher employment at lower wages. What you want is full employment at the highest possible wages. And to do that, we have to find ways to get the corn out of the silo. Now, there's not really corn in the silo because what really happens is the silos are small. So as the corn starts building up, we run out of silo space really quickly. And what ends up happening is we say we ought to shut down that field that grows corn because we don't have any capacity to store any more corn. And so you see the slowdown in the economy. So in 2007, we had a great mechanism for recycling all these savings, which was which was subprime mortgages, subprime consumption, and real estate development. We shut the banking system down on subprime mortgages. It's very difficult if you have a low credit rating to get credit today. And so really the only thing that's left to absorb this money is, uh, is real estate. So it's been advantageous to be in the real estate business because of this this dynamic that is, I think, a major macroeconomic problem that that we have to solve. I, and I agree. And you and I think you're bringing up something that has that you know we as or uh, you know me and my team that we, at Cashflow Dire, what we've been trying to do is to create more educated operators out there who can go actually soak up and use and 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 spread the message. Like, look. We know you have the money sitting on the sidelines, or as you said, the corn sitting in the silo. We know that storing that corn is is, is costing you money. It's not doing anything. It's actually mm-hmm. becoming worth less. I mean, uh, the, all of these things are happening. I I would argue that now, and and, and when we're going to talk about you know the economy and whatnot, I would argue that the it's a systemic issue that starts at. The, the, the educational system, meaning mm-hmm. that if we had a, a system that actually was – I call our system a schooling system, not an education system. And if it was an education system, we would have more people willing to create and take that risk and build and make things happen than we currently do. And I think that's I think that's fundamentally where the supply and demand imbalance is, is that we just don't have enough of those individuals willing to make that entrepreneurial risk. What say you? Yeah. Okay, now you know that I think those of you who are listening right now, you guys are a little bit different. You're the ones willing to take that risk. And maybe you're looking for that inspiration. You're looking for that next step, that idea that I don't know what it is, but hopefully you're finding it here. Hopefully you find it in not only this episode, but all of the other ones that we have produced. And I just want to say thank you for listening. So, With no further ado, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that every one of you know how you can get more inspiration, more ideas, and most importantly, well, just some good old-fashioned kick in the pants by reading my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. 
Go pick it up. Cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. You get your PDF copy, give you something to read, and most importantly, take action on. For those of you who like the audiobook versions of things, yes, do the same thing. Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book and you'll get a special discount on the audiobook. And then you can listen as others read and most importantly, take action. Let's get back to the rest of this story. I I agree with you. I think that, uh, so I think you're saying two things, both of which I strongly agree with. One is you are feeling the effects of a shortage of properly trained talent. You're saying the money's sitting in the silos, the corn's in the silo, and we don't have the expertise to go out and put it to work. And the second thing you're saying is, because school isn't giving our people those expert that expertise. And the reason for that is our schools are trying to teach everybody how to be scientists. Okay. And as I said, I'm an outstanding engineer who made all my money as a mediocre salesman. They're not teaching us how to be successful in life. And very few of us are going to need calculus in life. <laughs> and, you know, it just that is not what you know, I, I'm working at the you know, the highest echelon of business. And I've always said I've made, you know, a fortune solving two equations and two unknowns, which I solved in the eighth grade. Right. And most people aren't even don't even need to go. You don't even need that much math. And yet we're in there teaching people, you know, years of chemistry and physics. And I look at I'm all for some of that stuff. But there's a more much more practical set of life lessons right. about how do you deal with a difficult boss? How do you how do you serve a customer in a way that's going to make that customer satisfied? How do you identify problems and go out and solve problems that have very little to do with all the? I mean, we it's it, it's we're doing it all the way through. Uh, well, I'll say one other thing, which is interesting, which is we're doing it all the way through college as well. And part of the reason for that is because. Our faculty, which is all entrenched and in place and is going to change very slowly over time, they're largely in the business of proving how smart they are. And they can't prove how smart they are by teaching you how to deal with a difficult boss. They teach you how smart they are by solving some complicated math problem and say, see how smart I am. But it doesn't really prepare our people to be successful in life. And it, you, you look at the U.S., our most talented people have moved out of the math and science area, like me, to business. You also see them in communication. You see them in sales. You see them in networking and relationship-oriented businesses where they can make more money. The rest of the world is heavily skewed towards math and science. Europe and 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 Japan, for example, the other high-wage economies, and they're all rushing to move towards business because. If you just have math and science and you don't have guys that can execute on a to-do list and implement stuff and think about, you know, how do you satisfy a very angry customer, which math and science doesn't satisfy, you, you, you're not really going to turn the math and science into things that really uh, customers value. And so it's the combination of the two that has proven to be very, very valuable in the United States. The rest of the world is skewed in the other direction. And we still, I believe, haven't gotten through our education system to the optimal mix. And part of the reason for that, by the way, is if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, you know, America is one of the first uh, countries to create public education. We got everybody through high school and then we started putting everybody into college. And so we were the first uh, country to really produce college graduates in the world in a large scale. We were basically producing all the college graduates. so You could waste them all. You know, now you're in a situation where you're producing 10% of the world's college graduates and you are competing with them. You can't afford to be wasting the talent. And you know, I, lay, I, I say these things in the book on education. Another thing I say is there's a lot of very talented kids from low socioeconomic families that are not getting through college. And we have to go, we got to take every talented person we have and we got to get that person as effectively trained as we can persuade them to get, we can't afford to waste talent. I go a step further, which is I say there's about 100 million full-time workers in the U.S. economy. That's about 5 million of them would be at the uh, the top 5%, if you will. We could go potentially go out and recruit another 5 million of those people at the very highest end of the wage scale and potentially double the growth rate of the United States, which would make the economy better for everybody. Now, I don't want to go get a 50th or a 60th or an 80th percentile person who's going to compete with our our 
our people, I want to go and say, hey, what we have, our strength is business students. We need more and more business students. What the rest of the world has is a whole bunch of math and science people. We ought to just grab their best math and science people and haul them over here and team them up with our people and say, let's together, we've got the networks, we've got the customer relationships, we've got the institutional capabilities that make productive people more productive than anywhere else in the world. The combination of the two, I believe, is our one shot for really growing the economy. And I tell you, we are going to be eaten alive by baby boomers. You look at the Congressional Budget Office, it <laughs> says, you know, it says that federal, state, and local spending is government spending is 36% of GDP. The Congressional Budget Office says when baby boomers retire, it's going to increase nine percentage points to 45% of GDP. That's going to eat us alive. It's going to do major damage to our economy. And then we got to deal with the Chinese after that, who are going to be much more economically stronger, economically and militarily. We're not going to achieve this growth by sitting on our hands, expecting organic growth to get us there. We as America have to take a lot of steps to accelerate the growth rate, one of which could be uh, what you're describing, which is training our own people, much more effective life skills. Some of the things I'm describing, finding that talent that's not being utilized and making sure that we're nurturing it and getting it through the process and teaching it you know, the things that are valuable to, to the rest of the workers in our economy. And then augmenting that by going out and getting some of the most capable people in the world who are way more productive working in the United States than they are in the rest of the in their in their own homeland and don't really compete directly with the people who are here because you know if the Microsofts and the Googles of the world can't find this guy in the top two uh, percent they're going to go find some Russian engineer and Skype that guy in and when he Skypes in the doctor and the school teacher and the truck driver and the waitress are all going to be serving that guy in some other country instead of here right. driving up the wages of our our workers indeed indeed now you you mentioned one thing and it it, it, it just keeps coming up in the back of my head and I was like so I've got to say it is you know, the conversation that we're having, yeah, a lot of the companies that we're referring to are very, you know, technological in nature. And you can pretty much make an argument that nearly every company today is a technological company of some kind and, and has their hands in it if they're going to be around. But my concern becomes when we start talking about GDP and the economy, especially growing, is how on earth – with all of these things going on, how on earth do we compete when we don't have the exports we used to? People, I mean, you know, we're, we're, yep. what, we're not sending anything where it needs to go. We don't have the capacity to even manufacture <laughs> if we wanted to. But, you know, it just it creates this interesting thought yes. process, circular thought process in my head. I, I know exactly. So I, I agree. I let me tell a little story because, you know, I, did, I was in the Ford Motor Company as a manufacturing engineer. We take a plant in Indiana and we move it to Mexico and we tell those workers, don't worry, the entrepreneurs are coming. They're going to put you back to work. They're going to compete with each other. Uh, there's, they're going to invest capital. The more capital per worker, the higher your productivity, the higher your productivity, the higher your wages are going to be. There's capital sitting on the sidelines with zero interest rates, unused this is all going to be wonderful for you. And the guy says, wait a minute. The talented guys moved to California and outsourced their unskilled blue collar work to China. And the engineers who are left behind are designing products for workers in Mexico you know, and factories for workers in Mexico. Where's the entrepreneur that's coming to put me back to work? And what I argue in the book is that properly trained talent and entrepreneurial risk taking are the binding constraints. And what we see in the academic studies is that those communities end up depressed for decades. They don't recover because if you're a waiter waiting on waiters instead of a waiter waiting on doctors and engineers and high-tech entrepreneurs, you're going to make less money in the first economy than you are in the second economy. So one of the proposals I make, I say, look, we can't, you're never going to have manufacturing when you can get $8 an hour labor in Mexico and $3 an hour labor right. in China and you can float that labor on a boat. We can't afford to make for $20 what we could buy for $3 and think we're going to be competitive in the long run. But we, we there's no need to run the trade deficits that we're running. So right now, imports are about 16.5% of GDP. Exports are about 13% of GDP. The trade deficit is the difference, 3.5% of GDP. It's down from 5.5% of GDP prior to the financial crisis, primarily because we've become more energy independent 
with all the natural gas that we found, you know, in North Dakota and and, and other and other places. So we've seen the trade deficit come down a, a little bit. But as I said to you before, we it's it's basically. Germany that has way more savings than investment, China way more savings than investment, Japan previously and then their people retired, and Mexico is really an issue of corporate savings more than it is the savings of the people. But those four countries are running enormous trade deficits with us where they we we buy goods from them, so we're losing employment. And if we don't borrow the money and put it back to work, where we have very little use for that money, okay, and that money sits on the sideline we lose the employment. So the proposal I make in the book is that we should, for every dollar of exports, we should issue a license for a dollar of imports. Now, that would force trade to balance. And why do I think that's going to be good? Because if you think about a demand curve, if you think about the first dollar of trade is really, really valuable to America. The last dollar of trade break even because we would buy the next dollar if it was valuable to us. But at the last hour, 16.5% were basically at break even. Where are we at 13, 16 and a half? 13, you know, we get to the exports at 13% of GDP and we're rank ordering everything. We now have three and a half percent more to go of imports. Basically, we're at break even. But what's happening there? We're losing a job because we don't have the properly trained talent and we don't have the capacity for entrepreneurial risk taking to put that last three and a half percent to work. And so, we we have to have trade, even though it puts downward pressure on the wages. We don't have to suffer large trade deficits. And through the things we talked about, uh, of recruiting talent at the highest end and training our people more effectively, we can increase the demand for our lesser skilled workers. And in the process of these things, drive up the wages for the people who are here. Because remember, mm-hmm. that displaced worker in Indiana says, I'm waiting for the entrepreneurs to come. Oh, by the way, I see 40 million foreign-born adults, 20 million native-born children, and 20 million children and adult children, 20 million children and grandchildren. I see 80 million people also waiting for the entrepreneurs to come and put them to work too. And the, 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 the trade and immigration theory in economics is largely centered around balanced trade, which we haven't seen for decades. And it's largely... You know, centered around the idea that it, it that resources aren't constrained that that capital's not constrained if we had a certain amount of capital and we had twice as many workers and we spread the capital over twice as many workers we'd have half as much capital per worker we'd have less productivity we'd end up with lower wages and everyone says yeah but the capital isn't constrained because we have zero interest rates and the capital is sitting on the sideline because that's not the constraint the constraint is the very thing that you're feeling in your life which is where is the talented person who knows how to put that money to work? Why haven't we trained that person? They, 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 yeah, Lord knows it feels like they're hiding under a rock now. So that we, because there's probably a, a person or two who's listening, and, and I want to hear your answer to this. I know what my answer is, but I want to hear your answer to this. There's probably a person or two listening, a, a would-be entrepreneur or, or two listening, a, a, a real estate investor listening right now, especially that you buy and hold people. Please hear me, hear his answer right now to this question. What, because this is, I, I think what you are talk, you and I are talking about is hyper germane to exactly what we're talking uh, to, to the real estate investor and to the business owner. But can mm-hmm. you help uh, just in case there's someone who may not have, uh, may not understand, like, why are they, why is he so animated about this? Why is Jay talking? Why are we talking about this? How does this affect me and the fact that I just want to buy another single family house and have a tenant in it and and start my business and build my cash flow? Can you answer that question? Because I know somebody's asking it. Um, Well, for me, it matters because I feel that we all have a moral responsibility to our fellow man to to help them as much as we can. And that the talents of mankind, and it's probably not the answer you're looking for, but the talents of mankind are kind of randomly distributed among mankind and that those talents are not owned by the lucky recipients. They're owned by mankind, owned, belong to whatever. And that the people who were lucky recipients have a moral obligation to put their talent to work on behalf of everybody else. And that largely means taking the risks to and, and making the effort to serve customers more effectively, that the way you serve your fellow man is by largely by serving them as a customer. You can serve them in other ways to philanthropy, government service, et cetera. There, there are other ways to be sure, uh, in t- school teachers, many ways. 
but, but many of us, we roll up our sleeves and serve them as our customers. And we try to serve them more competitively than our competition does. And that is beneficial to our employees. It's beneficial to our customers. It's beneficial to our investors. It's always funny because everyone used to say when Mitt was running L. Bain Capital, all you care about is investors. And I said, you know, that is a prescription for failure. What really makes Bain successful, what really makes a business successful is they serve their customers more effectively than everybody else. And so, you know, I think ultimately you want to own a home, you want to uh, 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 have some tenants who live in that home. What you want to do is get the highest possible rent, the highest possible return on that house. And what determines that? is the efforts that you go to to satisfy your tenant more, more effectively than the guy next door. He's willing to pay you more. You're willing to spend your money more carefully, more thoughtfully to satisfy the needs that the guy really has. You're not wasting your money on stuff that that tenant doesn't really care about and that you're putting forward a product that's better than the, than the customer's alternatives. I, I'm not sure I answered your yeah. question, but no, no, no. That that's that's you are you are right there, and 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 right, you know, as a corollary to all of those things, that that tenant's not there if he doesn't have a job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if it does, absolutely, if, so it if it so it it becomes very self fulfilling. I mean, I hear you're calling to every entrepreneur. Look, go out there, take the risk, make it happen, please, because the country needs you. It's almost like a civic duty to make a business and provide jobs and then the 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 right behind that comes the real estate investor who's like look please buy some more houses because and provide clean safe affordable housing for this person who who is looking to work for this entrepreneur it's it we i believe we can fix our own problem with well you know what's, what's interesting about the real estate aspect of this problem too is that one of the biggest barriers to workers getting the, the uh, I mean, unskilled workers getting a better job is the cost of real estate, which is sky high. Right. And so you look at like places like San Francisco and you go, oh, it's very, good. very difficult for a low skilled worker to get a job in San Francisco because they can't afford the real estate. I don't think um, most of us listening to, or I mean, it's like, dude, I, I'll take a two square feet, please. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that might be the the most that that makes sense. I've seen some of those prices. I don't know what they're doing or thinking up there. It is insanity on a whole new level. Insanity yeah. on a whole new level. So. Let, let let me let's let's do this. I know that it's a number of people who have listened this far. That it's clear your book is absolutely filled with the data and the information that we need. My my uh, question to you is: that I know that they've listened this far. They probably want more. What's going to be the best way for them to track you down and 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 find more about what you're up to, and maybe even get a copy of the book? Well, uh, the best way would be to go to my website, www.edwardconnor.com. That's C-O-N-A-R-D, edwardconnor.com. You'll see more of, uh, more of me than you'll ever going to want to see. <laughs> but I've bet, done a lot of television appearances. I've debated uh, uh, with economists. Um, I've been on uh, liberal radio shows, uh, I mean, and TV shows. I've been on conservative uh, TV and radio shows. I think you'll see my views are pretty consistent across all of them. I do come from a somewhat conservative economic perspective, but I think you'll see that my heart is in the right place, which is I am trying to find a way to increase the wages, the employment of our middle and working class workers. I really don't give a damn about the guys at the top end. As Mitt used to say many times, don't worry, they'll all take care of themselves just fine. And I do believe that what we need is a lot more entrepreneurial risk taking and business activity in order to drive up the employment and wages of, of everybody else in the economy. And I argue that we have a moral responsibility to do it. Indeed. Now, um, I'm going to, as we wrap up here, I'm getting to this last question. I'm actually kind of excited to hear your answer because this is, this is going to be great um, because it's, it's, it's addressed to a particular person. And I want you for a moment, if you would, Ed, to pretend that there's a, a would-be entrepreneur listening right now. They are standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They think they want to do this entrepreneurial thing, but in the back of their head, they have that voice. And, and I know you've dealt with that voice. Uh, it's that voice that comes up anytime you think you want to do something great, be more than your present place. I dare I say, serve your fellow man by providing a product or a service at a profit. <laughs> Who would have thought, you know, but that voice comes up and, and occasionally it says things like you, you can't, you, who are you to think you can? And for some people, 
they're related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that 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 would-be entrepreneur standing in front of the superhero outfit store right now would actually do what you would suggest, and they would do so in the next 24 to 48 hours, what would you suggest they do? Uh, I haven't really thought about the answer. I mean, I, I would, I, some combination of, I would tell them that the downside is not as risky as they fear because they'll learn a lot. They're probably pretty talented people and you're going to discover there's a shortage of people like you and the world's got a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for those people. If you go out, try and fail, you're going to discover that the, that the ability to execute a to-do list and to supervise yourself and to supervise other people in any form, even if it's a, a, a fast food restaurant as opposed to some high-tech venture, it's the same fundamental set of skills and they're highly, highly valued. And if you go out and try and it doesn't work, you might be set back economically, yes, uh, but I think your, your skill development will increase and you're going to find ultimately that when you go to the next either venture or to the next company or to the next employer, that those skills are even more valuable than they were before. So I would encourage people to try, although I recognize, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of, it's a lot of risk. There's a lot of randomness. And as a result, there's a lot of, of failure, whether you're good at it or not. I can tell you that one of the ways that Bain Capital made money was persuading managers to take more risk. What we saw was that companies had great opportunities in front of them and the managers weren't taking full advantage of those opportunities. And what we were constantly doing was to push them to invest more, to try more experiments, to to try uh, introduce more products with customers, to increase the amount of entrepreneurial risk taking they were taking because they were inevitably taking way less than what was optimal. And it's true of the individual, too. The only difference is, you know, in companies, you can try 10 things and six of them fail, but, you know, one or two of them really work well. So they they bail you out. When you're one person taking one risk, you are taking a lot more risk because if you got a one in five chance of it working, you know, you want to be very, very careful and thoughtful about that risk that you take. But I would tell you that I think that the light at the end of the tunnel, even if you fail, is way better than you think it is. Nice. Totally well said. I definitely have enjoyed our time together today, and I definitely appreciate you taking the time to invest your knowledge, your expertise, and wisdom here with us at the Cashflow Diary, sir. Jay, thanks for having me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means go to the website. That means read the book. That means start a business because what? It's awesome and it's fun and you know you've wanted to do so for quite some time. Maybe write one more offer today. Maybe talk to one more investor today. Make something happen. Create a job. Provide some clean, safe, affordable housing. As you just heard, it's kind of like your civic duty. So let's go make it happen together. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.